What is up everybody? Welcome back. I want to do a video today and this isn't really a tutorial as much as it's more of a philosophical discussion. And I want to talk about this term that I'm using, printing with intent, and we'll get into that in a second. But what is the intention of a photographer? And this has to do with personal style. It has to do with the look of your work. And I want to talk about color work. And there's a couple of photographers that I want to bring up right now because they all share something in common but are very different. And first of all, we have William Eggleston. If you're not familiar with William Eggleston, he came along at a time and introduced color photography into the fine art world, which up until that point was largely monochrome. Usually black and white, some sienna types, and various tonalities, but there was a certain look of what was accepted as fine art photography in the museum world up until William Eggleston came along. And then it was John Sarkowski at MoMA who gave him a solo show, and a lot of people argue that that solo show really blew the doors wide open. William Eggleston became the change agent. His work is a little jarring, it's a little shocking, it looks like just... Uh, vernacular scene sometimes, but love him or hate him, he did a lot for that world. And now that opened the doors for a lot of other photographers to come onto the scene who were shooting largely in color and have that accepted as quote unquote art. But William Eggleston is a huge influence on me. I love his work. Um, I think it has such an interesting vibe to it. And there's so much personality that goes into that. But William Eggleston is on one end of the spectrum. Uh, another photographer that I am largely influenced by is a gentleman named Ernst Haas. And Ernst Haas, Actually, this is kind of interesting. He was actually the first color photographs that were shown at the Museum of Modern Art in a group show. However, William Eggleston gets the credit because he had a solo show, and quite frankly, his work is a little more radical than Ernst Haas. But Ernst Haas has a beautiful uh, sense of color to what he does. Um, you know, I think upon finding the work of Haas and some of these people, for me, I had always started out and being trained more classically in the sense that composition should never be dependent on color. It should work in monochrome, and then color acts as a bit of a seasoning to enhance whatever it is that you've done. But what's interesting are there are several images of Ernst Haas that are largely dependent on color and it makes it work. One of my favorites is the scene, very high contrast, and you don't realize what you're seeing at first, but it's a red stoplight that's in the scene. And it adds such a point of interest to that composition. There's a lot that's going on with contrast to the rest of the color that you see here. There's a pretty minimal color palette in general, but this is a situation where that actually works. And I absolutely love the work of Ernst Haas. Another photographer that is a big influence on me is an Italian photographer by the name of Luigi Ghiri. And Luigi is very interesting. He is always conceptual. He was part of a movement in Italian photography where this high concept approach to working uh, and the way elements play together in a scene and what's being said through the image was very in vogue at that time. And I think Luigi Ghiri is absolutely fantastic. His work has a very different look than the other two photographers I've just named. He has more of a pastel color palette that's going on. Tones tend to be more muted. Uh, the images tend to be very bright. Um, he was very insistent during his career of printing everything with a, speci a specified white border around the image. And so uh, there was a lot of intention that came from Luigi Geary. And then finally, another photographer I've showed a lot on this show that I think a lot of us are inspired by is a gentleman named Saul Leiter. Saul was not known during his career as a color photographer, but much later when he started working with the Howard Greenberg Gallery in New York, Greenberg discovered this huge body of personal work that he'd done just for fun using Kodachrome and all these slides. And then they started doing shows and of course everything exploded and now we know Saul for this work. But it wasn't until maybe the mid to late 90s when a lot of this started coming to the attention of the public. But Saul has a completely different look to what he does. All four of these photographers have a different look, a different style, a different approach, and they're saying different things. Their intent is very different. It's very personalized. What's interesting is they all shot on the same film. And I've mentioned this once or twice before, but they were all Kodachrome users. And it's always fascinated me uh, being today in the digital age when we look back at that. And this is all pre-computer, all the work I've just showed you. And so this was all done, what we call analog now, but it was all done in a dark room. And so there was no Lightroom software or Photoshop to go in and manipulate colors. There was no inkjet printing. This was all done in the analog world. Yet the baseline for all these photographers in terms of the material that they're capturing the image on is the same. So when we consider Kodachrome especially having a really specific look, and by the way, there are many specific looks to Kodachrome. It changed a lot over the years. But these guys were all shooting the same baseline in terms of their image capture. And so what is it that makes them look different? And this is when I want to get into talking about printing. Because this is something that has changed over the years in photography. And I think today, 
we experience the world of photography largely through internet-driven devices. So something like Instagram, and I'm not bashing Instagram. There's nothing wrong with it. I absolutely love Instagram. It is one of my favorite things in the world, and I love keeping up with people. I love the way that it's not really text-based as much as it is image-based, and it's using images to communicate and tell a story, whether people are like really serious photographers or whether they're just shooting pictures on their phone. It captures an intimacy of the moment. It describes what people are doing in visual terms, and it really embraces a visual language. And anyway, that's neither here nor there. But when we make images today, whether you capture them on film or from a digital camera, generally we make some modifications on those to express our intent of what that photograph should look like. And then that gets uploaded to the internet. And this is very different than the way it used to be. If you go back before the computers, before the internet, the way that photographers would have their work seen, you would come back with negatives or positives if you're shooting chrome film, but you have these little tiny little images that are sometimes in reverse in terms of whether they're color or black and white or what kind of film you're using. And so you have to print those. And in the old days, you could go to any drugstore and they would handle color printing. When I was a kid, it was a big machine back there and you drop your photos off and you could pay extra for the one hour development, but usually it would take a couple days to a week and you could get double prints. And there was no intent that was going into any of that. Somebody is just has a machine that's programmed. It's simply takes the negatives and it makes quote unquote prints, those little four by six prints out of those. You have no control as the artist over whether anything's being cropped or not. And you know, there's a certain beauty and approach to that, but it's very different than what we have now. People who were serious about their work or professional photographers often would have prints that were blown up really large, shown in museums, art galleries, uh, books, magazines. And books and magazines are completely a different world than the gallery museum world. And so it was very common, and still is today, for photographers to work with a master printer to go get that intention realized. And there's a lot that goes into that. So I'm not talking about pre-visualization or anything. I'm just talking about the intent of a photographer. And that intent comes from uh, personal experience, personal taste, the photographer's style, and how they want to see that work portrayed in the end. And so there are a lot of variables that can go into that. And let's just say we're going to hang these in some kind of exhibition, whether it's a gallery or museum. You need to know, one, what kind of paper is it being printed on? Two, what are the lighting conditions in the room? Three, is it under glass? These are all kinds of things that can have drastic uh, differences in how that image comes out in the end. And so that's where it's very helpful, particularly with color work. A lot of people in black and white would do their own printing um, and still do today. But with color, it's a little bit different. And so working with a printer who understands those things is something that's really essential. And they bring an expertise to the table. But the printer is not there to put their own voice on anything. The printer is there to work with the photographer to come in and say, hey, these reds really are not popping off the, the image like I want them to, or the, there's not enough contrast here, or a lot of notes will be made. And that printer helps that realization come into play. Now, when I'm talking about this printing with intent and these intentions of a photographer, this is actually not um, my thesis per se. Uh, my really good friend, Richard Jackson, who you guys have seen in these videos before, it's been a little while, he lives in Flagstaff, Arizona. He was in the video I did, some of the behind the scenes stuff with David Brookover. He works with David back when I did David's Artist Series video. I'll put some links below. Uh, he was also in Flagstaff when I was there last time. He's worked with the guys with Hidden Light before and uh, great guy, extremely intelligent, very smart. I've always loved the term master printer. It makes it sound like he's a Jedi or something. Anyway, last time I was in Flagstaff, I started talking to Richard. We went out for breakfast one morning and I wanted to talk about the possibility of something that we could collaborate on because he's a really smart guy. He's worked with some of the biggest names in the business. He currently does a lot of work with Jeff Wall. And if you're not familiar with Jeff, you should look him up. He's an amazing photographer as well. And Richard was telling me he'll go up to his studio and there's literally crates sitting around the studio uh, full of framed images that were on loan to one museum and they're getting ready to get shipped off to another and they're just coming back through the studio. And he has a lot of things going on all the time and he has to spend his time making photographs. And so to have somebody come in and help him with the printing side of it, um, it's a really interesting vocation. I think what Richard does and I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. And so we've talked about a few things and last week Richard had sent me an email and he shared this paper that he was working on called Photographing with Intent. And so I started asking him about it. And, you know, I, I brought up my hypothesis of these four photographers that I'm just enamored with their work, yet they all have a completely different look, despite the capture material being the same for everyone. And he said, well, that's the print. That's the intent. That's what's coming out in the end. He shared the paper with me. And we're going to do something on here. And the paper that he's working on is part of a workshop that he's proposed. In fact, I will put a link to the workshop in the show description. I will tell you now, this is not 
not an inexpensive workshop. This is something for people who are really serious about learning how to print, but you will be amazed at what you will discover in this workshop. It's led by Marielle Wilkes and Wesley Bernard, and of course, Richard Jackson will be there as well. And it's called Photography with Intent. It's going to be August 12th through 18th at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. And Ghost Ranch is where George O'Keefe lived. So it'll be a really interesting place. Um, and this is a really serious workshop. It's not just a weekend getaway. It's like you're going to learn some big stuff. And so I'll put a link to that in the description if you're interested. Um, but anyway, Richard and I were talking about it. And we have a couple ideas that we're working on that I want to bring him in and have some say in some printing things that we can talk about on the show. Because really, uh, he's one of the best, I think, especially when you consider color work, the experience level that he's got. Um, I can't think of anybody that I've met that's on that level. And uh, he's a really nice guy um, as well. And this is going to dovetail into some of the things that we've done. And uh, you guys, if you keep up with the videos that I've made over the last couple months, one of the things that I've started to talk about a little more is Lightroom and Capture One because I use both those software applications and I think they're incredible. And I want to do some tutorials in those areas, but... One of the things is that there's a lot of tutorials on Lightroom already. There's a lot of tutorials on Capture One. And I think there's something different that can be brought to that table. And let me give you an example. One of the things I've been working on, which is why these four photographers came up earlier in this video, is one of the things that I've been working on is I, I set out to see if I could develop some presets that, that kind of come up with that intent that I'm looking for in the software. And a lot of my taste, because I shot film for so many years, is probably why. I think digital photography is great, but digital photographs tend to be, especially with raw photographs, here's your data and you can get this to look like you want. So you have flexibility there. So if the hue in the sky isn't quite, or maybe it's too jarring for you, you can adjust that. And so there's adjustments to be made. And of course, you can take this as far as actual photo manipulation. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a realization of what you envision with the photograph, which would be color adjustments. And to their credit, there are a couple companies, uh, Visco's the big one, that have gone to painstaking lengths to do film simulation presets for Lightroom. And so, for instance, if you go get all the Visco packages, you can go, you know, apply a, uh, well, they're not LUTs, they're presets, but you can go apply a look that will make that image from the camera you took it with uh, look exactly like Agfa Optima 100 or 400, or, I mean, it's down to the ISO differences in film. And they did a really wonderful job on that. But there's a couple issues that come up for me, first of all is option anxiety. You have way too many options in there. There are literally hundreds of presets and I have a bunch of these and they're great, but am I just applying a filter? That's kind of this Instagram approach of like just, it, photographs I don't think need to be made by chance. And I think you as a photographer don't intend chance to be part of that process. So just kind of going through and picking filters that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, however, I do think they make a great starting point if you have a look in mind that you're going for in the end, but there's just so many of them. And so that's some of the problems that I have with film-based presets. You know, there's a lot of obsession that photographers have with getting the film look. And I'm all for that, but do you want to emulate the film or do you want to learn how to use the software to get the look that you're going for? Uh, an interesting discussion with... Um, uh, my friend Doug at Digital Transitions, we were talking about Capture One, and he was involved in the process where they actually did a film emulation for one of the Fuji stocks, and I can't remember which one it is offhand, and you can purchase that through the website. And he said to actually do that, it took hundreds of hours of testing and going back and forth, and then you have to go shoot on that film, and you have to have a really good source image to work with to match those up. And he said, we would love to do more of that in Capture One, and it immediately made me think, why do you want to emulate film stocks in Capture One? That's like getting you to that base level. Remember the four photographers I just talked about and how their work has an, a uniqueness and an individuality to it, even though they were all using the same film. So it's kind of like we're going backwards and we're trying to put this gloss of a film look on something. Anyway, that's what I'm going for. So what I would rather do is talk about how to achieve different looks and how you can learn and use the software to your advantage to do that. This is where I want to hear from you. I'm going to, I'm working on these now. I've done a lot of work. In fact, uh, some of the images I've been publishing on Instagram, I'll roll through a few of them here, but uh, a little before and after. And these are maybe a little bit heavy handed, but it's the look that I'm trying to go for. And these are just presets that I'm developing from scratch. And I hate to think of them as a preset necessarily is, but that preset 
as a starting point. And so you can apply the preset and then you know what it is you want to adjust to kind of start moving away from there, which I suppose is somewhat like emulating film stock. But I would like to hear from you guys and I would like to hear what you would like to see uh, in approaching Lightroom and Capture One and various software applications in terms of what is that approach? What is it that you want to get out of it? And so please leave me a comment in the discussion below. And that's all I have for today. I want to hear from you and I'm going to be putting these together in the next couple months. So until the next video, I'll see you guys then. Later.